Well, good morning to everyone. Uh, it's such a pleasure to be here today uh, and for me to be hosting this uh, third in our lecture series uh, of the Nelson Mandela School of uh, Public Governance. And uh, with me today is uh, Dr. Jafar Javan, who has come all the way from Turin uh, to visit the Nelson Mandela School. And uh, some of you may recall that we have uh, already had two previous speakers in our guest lecture series um, during uh, the past uh, few months. This is the third in our series, and uh, it's a great pleasure for me uh, to introduce uh, Jafar, who's uh, become a friend of ours um, at the Nelson Mandela School. We have uh, begun to build a very strong partnership with the uh, the United Nations System Staff College, which uh, does quite a lot of work, which is similar to the work of the Nelson Mandela School of Public Governance. We are both engaged in uh, support and capacity building to public policy officials uh, and uh, change agents uh, working uh, in different areas of public policy. So Dr. Jafar uh, has got an impeccable record. He has uh, studied um, in the United States in various uh, universities, uh, doing his doctorate in uh, social psychology uh, at the North Carolina State University. He has a, a long uh, and very exciting career in the United Nations system. He told me that he started as an intern and uh, worked his way up step by step, <laughs> did his PhD while he was uh, still working in the, in the United Nations um, and uh, served in uh, various parts of the world um, in uh, um, countries like uh, Bratislava, and serving in some of the uh, East uh, European countries uh, in uh, Central Asia and um, and then uh, <clears throat> got invited uh, to participate in the work of the United Nations System Staff College. And I must uh, say how pleased I am to uh, um, invite you to give this third guest lecture, Dr. Jahan. Um, we are really looking forward to listening to you. Uh, you indeed uh, have worked with the leaders uh, across the UN system. Uh, working closely with the Office of the Secretary General and uh, training uh, and providing support to um, some of the most outstanding and talented people uh, in the UN system. So you must have gained uh, a great deal of insight and knowledge about leadership. And uh, we're looking forward to uh, your lecture on, on leadership and uh, some of the insights that you bring to us uh, from your past experience. So over to you, Dr. Jahan. Thank you very much, Jafet. I really appreciate it. And thank you all for, for inviting me to uh, talk a little bit about uh, uh, leadership um, in the public sector. Uh, it's really an honor to be here uh, at the Nelson Mandela School of Governance of the University of Cape Town to talk about leadership um, because uh, I think to me and probably millions of other people, uh, Mandela personifies good leadership. So to, to be here or to be able to, uh, to talk to you a little bit about sort of, you know, what I think good leadership uh, in the public sector is all about is really an honor. Uh, I, it's a dream come true, you know, to uh, sort of to be here uh, and in Cape Town in South Africa um, and uh, to talk about uh, different parts, uh, different elements of leadership where uh, Mandela really sort of brought um, not only to South Africa, but the world. Um, I, Originally, I was asked to talk about ethical leadership, and um, I decided that, um, you know, I'd really like to talk about adaptive leadership, because to me, um, and I would explain 
sort of what you what what I mean by adaptive leadership, because to me, uh, ethical leadership is a must for good leadership. And uh, um, we know basically sort of the 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 main sort of elements of what ethics or you know, ethical leadership is all about. And uh, um, to be a good leader, you have to be an ethical person. Um, and uh, to me, it's ingrained in what good leadership is all about. So I decided to really go a bit more sort of into uh, the concept of adaptive leadership, which ethical leadership is probably the center of, of the concept. Um, I particularly don't like lectures. You know, I, I like discussion. Um, so uh, if there are any sort of uh, uh, questions or any remarks that you, you would like to, to make, please feel free to stop me and let's have a conversation rather than just a one way sort of lecture. Um, I wanted to, uh, uh, you know, give you a sort of a, a traditional view of, of leadership. Um, before I do that, actually, I wanted to say that um, I, I'm not an expert in leadership per se. I don't go out and, and uh, sort of uh, uh, give, uh, you know, classes on leadership, although now more and more I'm being asked to, to uh, sort of specifically talk about leadership. Um, but uh, over the last 10 years or, or, or so, I have heard so many leadership experts, you know, coming to us for various courses and programs that we have um, that I now I think I've sort of heard it all. <laughs> I've heard it all. And um, the, 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 the approach that uh, has sort of uh, resonated with me the most um, is adaptive leadership. And adaptive leadership was is the term that was coined by uh, Professor Ron Heifetz and uh, Marty Linsky of Harvard and uh, the Center for Public Leadership. And they came up actually with this uh, uh, sort of concept. And uh, at, at least with me, that is sort of the closest thing that has sort of, you know, um, it, attached to, to my uh, views, my experiences. And, and uh, so now I go around and I talk about adaptive leadership. <laughs> um, now, you will see why. I think it's very sort of uh, common sense. It's very common sense. Um, you know, if we look at the uh, traditional view of leadership, so, uh, you know, leaders, uh, basically, uh, what do traditionally we think of leaders? You know, those are people, uh, individuals who are really sort of, they have, they have it all, you know, they have, uh, um, you know, they're extrovert, they, you know, talk the room, they can impress people, uh, they have the vision, they have the connections, uh, um, they are extremely uh, intelligent and, you know, they dominate the room, you're sitting and the guy usually, you know, so it's a guy uh, and uh, uh, comes into the room and everybody notices, you know, who this person is. He's, he's uh, very stable, he doesn't get emotional, he, uh, you know, he decides and, and that kind of thing. Um, he's uh, basically, you know, he's the, the boss, the authoritative, um, and, uh, and you know, it's everything ends up with, with him. So this leadership is very much, this style of leadership is very much sort of um, associated, dominated by individuals' vision and individuals' knowledge. That's really sort of a traditional view. Now, um, and it continues, you know, it, 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 it depends on the culture, it depends on the context. Um, and, uh, but I think one thing that we noticed was, uh, you know, over the, the time, things have changed and things have changed, issues have become much more complex, much more uh, um, 
sort of you know intertwined with with a uh, number of other things so it's not that easy to sort of uh, personify good leader as you know the, someone with these type of characteristics and i think what um, um happened was uh, covid was a testament that i uh, just to uh I'll give you an example i thought that one of the best examples that uh, there are many on uh, climate change uh, um, and the growth in, in, in digital transformation technology and, 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 and all kinds of uh, you know, issues in the political domain. But I decided to, to use COVID as an example. Um, and uh, so, uh, you know, if we look at the sort of traditional view of leadership that I just uh, spoke uh, about uh, a few minutes ago, um, you know, did that really work when the COVID happened? So, um, uh, and I think that we can all agree that uh, we, the, it, COVID was really a sort of a, a challenge to test what we mean by good leadership. And I think uh, um, in most places in, in the world, um, basically the leadership failed to some extent. Um, in, in order to manage um, the, the, all the uh, issues and challenges that uh, came out of the pandemic. Um, now, the basically, uh, um, I think uh, uh, what happened was that the traditional uh, uh, view of leadership uh, was not enough to uh, to deal with the complexity and the sort of the connections and the interconnectedness of uh, solutions that we needed to to uh, um, to deal with the pandemic. You know, the pandemic was a uh, uh, you know a multi-dimensional challenge. It you know it was a, a public health issue. Uh, it affected the economy. It it it, it, it affected the social and polit political side of the society. Um, so, um, you know, it, it, and it's some of the most uh, advanced economies uh, and rich countries in the world, uh, with the exception of few that we all know um, in New Zealand and, and so forth, that by the way, we had women leaders. Um, the rest really didn't come up to, uh, um, to, to, to be able to, uh, to deal with it effectively. Um, and I use COVID because it was a, a, a huge, huge challenge, but also the fact that uh, it was a, uh, a, a sort of a multi-dimensional um, challenge that we faced. And I use it because to say that in, in life, whether you're in the private sector or in the public sector, um, this is the norm. You, no particular problem has a, a solution and no particular problem that you, you, you're dealing with or the challenges you're facing um, has a, a one particular dimension, it's multi-dimensional. So um, there are basically, um, I think, a couple of takeaways that there are no simple um, pain solutions. Um, and uh, uh, so we have to constantly uh, be able to, uh, to, to look at uh, um, new options, new solutions, new ways of doing things. Um, and uh, um, that really requires a, a huge uh, sort of shift of attitudes, uh, behaviors, and, and, and values. Um, you know, I was, this morning I, I was going over my sort of presentation and I thought, okay, what example can I give uh, that really relates uh, to the situation in, 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 I don't know if it's South Africa wide or it's just in Cape Town. So the idea, the, 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 the problem that you are facing now is the blackout, right? Mm -hmm. So, uh, um, and I know quite about uh, uh, quite a bit about blackouts because where I come from in Iran, blackouts is basically it's it's a daily occurrence, and it happens 
up for obvious reasons uh, during summertime. Mm -hmm. um, and, uh, you know, the first sort of uh, the, the place to blame is obviously the public sector, you know, starting from the president is in, you know, he's not able to manage it. And to the minister and to the uh, uh, Ministry of uh, Energy and, 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 and so forth. And because when that happens, you pe people in general, they like to uh, um, sort of point their finger at a particular authority or, or, or an institute that you present sort of uh, uh, is responsible for uh, uh, what happens, whether it's the mayor or, you know, traffic is always the mayor's uh, fault and, and blackout is a combination of uh, sort of ministries and, and departments, uh, energy, the, the, um, the, the, uh, the, again, you know, it's always the mayor that, 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 that has somehow hasn't been able to, uh, to do his or her job correctly and corruption and this and that. And I was also thinking that as a public uh, servant, sometimes uh, we, we forget. I'm, 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 I'm an international civil servant, so I get paid um, to be a servant. To, to uh, my constituencies, basically the citizens of, of the world. My salary comes from uh, taxpayers' uh, pockets. They 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 uh, they pay for 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 my uh, my work, and I always have to look at myself as a servant. Um, and in my case, in an international. Um, setting, but uh, when you work for a government, you're a servant at a uh, national uh, sort of a setting, national context. Therefore, my job and the job of any public servant is to uh, uh, provide services, provide services because we are paid by the citizens. Um, I don't think that particular attitude exists in many places. Um, and always we sort of think uh, we lose uh, sort of that perspective. We think that we are sort of, you know, controlling, we are uh, doing uh, basically uh, uh, a, uh, a service for you that you should appreciate, um, which uh, I think is probably one of the, 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 the most uh, um, sort of uh, problems that we have in terms of good leadership is that thinking that 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 uh, sort of attitude um, that now I am a public sir I am in the governor I am the minister I am the director of the um, uh, a particular uh, department therefore I am entitled to you know whatever that I'm entitled to um, which I think is the wrong way of looking at leadership in the public sector is the other way around. I have to provide services. I have to do my job. Uh, I have to uh, um, be accountable for, for the work that I do. Um, and then how do you push that? How do you get that into the mindset of public servants? It's really a challenge. Um, and uh, there has to be more work on the whole concept of accountability and, and, and how do you uh, sort of uh, get a job in the public se uh, sector thinking that you are accountable to uh, your constituency, to you, to, to the citizens that at the end are basically paying for your salary. Now, um, if we go, if we can go next slide. Um, so the notion of leadership over time has changed. You know, the old way of looking at it, yet uh, if you're a good leader, serious leader, um, effective leader, you get people to follow. Um, and, uh, um, you know, if you are going to lead, then you have to lead with uh, deep, you know, conviction. Um, you have to believe in what you do on um, getting people to do what you want them to do. Um, basically, you are the person, uh, you are the boss, you are the, the couple, you know, you, you, you decide what you, so basically it all comes into that person. Um, but I think now over time, because of all kinds of 
um, sort of uh, develop these events in the world, um, we now see that they're beginning to, to, to be a, a new sort of way of looking at good leadership. You know, a good leader is the one that can mobilize uh, people to face reality. And whether the reality is sweet or sour, you know, you have to deal with it, you have to resolve it. So it's not really me as the leader uh, sort of confronting the challenge, but me as the leader to be able to, uh, able to bring the right people um, to basically resolve the, the, the problems uh, that, that we are facing uh, and uh, making sure that people understand that, you know, it's a complicated, complex world and uh, we have to face reality. So it's really a, a sort of being able to orchestrate um, a, a problem solving um, sort of a, a scenario that we are we're dealing with. So um, it's no longer me, I can do all. Today I'm dealing with foreign relations, tomorrow I'm dealing with um, road construction, you know, you have to rely on your experts. And uh, um, it's uh, also, um, you know, coming up with new uh, ideas, new ways to do things better, more efficient. Um, and uh, therefore, to me, I think uh, leadership is not really a title. It, it's, it's, it's no longer, uh, you know, because I am the director, because I am the minister, Therefore, I'm a leader. I, I think leadership is an activity. Uh, you can be leader at any level. Uh, you can, if you have a good idea and you're able to develop the idea and then implement the idea and you're the one that actually are at the forefront of resolving a problem that an institution or your department or office has, then that's to me, it's a leadership act. So it's not the title. The title is, uh, you know, I have problems also in, in, in our own work at the staff college because we have all kinds of courses um, that uh, we have for senior leaders and emerging leaders and junior leaders and so forth. And I always say, I understand people can sort of comprehend this better if it's sort of segmented into to that. But uh, um, aren't they really leaders? You know, and people don't like to hear that, especially those that are coming to these courses because they see themselves as leaders. And we always push and say, um, you know, leadership is not the title, but it's basically uh, the act that that that, yeah, that you are uh, performing. Of course, you know, good leadership the new sort of approach to leadership has all the elements that we, we, we all know, and I'm not going to, to repeat all of them, but some of them is, you know, it's, it's empathy. You know, you have to, to have empathy. You have to understand um, what others are saying. You have to be able to put, your, uh, um, to, uh, put yourself in the other person's shoes and understand what his or her sort of views are or, or, or fears are. are or, or constraints are, um, you have to also be able to, uh, to, uh, to have this amazing sort of capacity to listen just because you are uh, in a leadership position um, doesn't mean that you know at all. You don't. In fact, there are many, many uh, instances, cases where people know more than you. So don't try to be the one that uh, I know it all and this is the way it is and, and, and so forth. So um, listen to others. Um, you know, I always, always, um, if there are, just to give you an example, two, two, three weeks ago, I was asked to, to write something about uh, women and digital uh, transformation. And that's not really my area. I don't know much about it. So I, I, I told uh, our communication person, I said, look, I don't know anything. I mean, I know a little bit. I can talk five minutes, a few minutes if I'm lucky. But in order to write about it, I need you know, somebody who really knows about this. So uh, he said, well, you know, it, because it was the, it, uh, the Women's International Women's Day, the message should go out from the director. So we write 
uh, something and put your name on it. I said, not really. <laughs> I don't like it. If I'm going to write something, it would be myself writing it. But put the name of the person. And uh, he said, nobody has to go from the director. So something was written and my name was there. But if you see it on our blog, it wasn't me. I had nothing to do with it. Um, so I think we, we have to also be able to face criticism. Um, you have to be able to uh, um, don't take it personally. If it's not, you know, a personal sort of your character and all these things. So uh, um, it happens when you are in those positions, then, you know, some people would like you, some people don't. Uh, and you have to be able to, to see if, you know, you do something that is not very popular. Why? Why are people uh, are not too keen to... Uh, um, sort of follow you, uh, um, follow your decision and, 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 and do things like that. So you have to be able to, to deal with, uh, uh, um, you know, sometimes harsh criticism. It's, it's, it's okay, it's okay, it comes with the job. And to me, it's also humility, you know. Uh, humility is, 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 is something which, um, be humble, you know. You have to be humble, um, you're not the, the, the uh, um, sort of the invisible leader that uh, um, nothing, you know, affects them. No, no. Uh, it's, it's, it's uh, um, basically nature of human beings. We make mistakes uh, um, and uh, we have to be able to face the reality and, and uh, uh, admit that we made the mistakes. Um, also, uh, to me, um, one of the most important part of good leadership is uh, being able to make decisions. If anything, that decision making, that decision making um, sort of uh, capability is huge. Some of the, 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 the problems that we face in the public sector, whether you take it at the international level or national level, is that we don't like to make decisions. We like to push you know, the issue up. Um, so if it doesn't go well, what is his fault, his fault is, is this, you know? Um, so what we do at the college, at the U.S. Staff College, we try to really encourage and push um, people that look, decision-making is part of your job, regardless of where in the hierarchy of the organization you're sitting, um, you have to make decisions. And, uh, um, you know, you make decisions, sometimes bad decisions, face it uh, and deal with it. And, and, uh, um, and good decisions, well, bravo, well done, but you're getting paid. So don't forget that. <laughs> uh, um, so now, um, you know, I like this. This actually uh, I, I, I got from Heifetz and Linsky uh, themselves. The leadership is disappointing your people at the rate they can absorb. <laughs> <laughs> so um, it's, uh, you know, adaptive leadership is a very practical leadership framework that helps individuals and organizations to adapt changing environments and effectively respond to recurring uh, problems. Um, and, you know, what does it mean that, you know, leadership is a dis a disappointing your people at the rate that they can absorb? Because uh, if there are changes, and change is, is a natural phenomenon that happens in our daily lives, in, in our family, but also very much so in the work environment. So people don't like change. People don't like change. I'm currently facing a big challenge in my organization. Um, and uh, because we're going to basically implement uh, um, some serious changes. People always feel that uh, you know, this change is going to affect me personally. I'm no longer um, going to be able to do this and that. And there will be some new person coming. Maybe do I have my a job uh, still, you know, once this sort of uh, change takes place and so forth. Um, so change in, in, in general is not really viewed positively. 
So, um, and sometimes as a leader that comes with new ways of doing business, it's going to disappoint a lot of the people. Um, now, how much disappointment can you generate? I think you have to be very cognizant of it because if you generate too many disappointments, then basically you lose sort of the enthusiasm, the commitments, and 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 the uh, sort of uh, the passion of the people who allow you to do what you need to to do or to be done. Therefore, if you're constantly telling people, ah, oh, I don't like the way you're doing this. No, what you're doing is, is wrong. Then I think you, you're gonna create an environment where people say, look, you know, this guy is never happy. He's never able to, to say thank you. That was a good idea, you know? So be careful in terms of, uh, but at the same time, you also, we all had, had bosses that uh, um, basically they were kind of easy. Huh? Whatever I did, wonderful. Whatever he did, wonderful. Well, if everybody is doing a wonderful job, then why are we in the mess we are? <laughs> right? So, uh, so, uh, so uh, you know, easy bosses, tough bosses, but I think uh, there's a middle ground there. You know, as someone says, and I don't, I, I believe it was Marty Linsky that uh, said that the good leadership is somewhere between here, the brain and the heart. You just have to find it. But you know, it's here and here. How do you find it? It's the challenge. Um, now, maybe, we, yeah, the pressure cooker. So as a leader, it helps to think of yourself as keeping your hand on the thermostat. So carefully controlling how much heat and pressure is applied. Um, and it's like a pressure cooker. Set the temperature and the pressure is too low and you stand to, to the, you stand no chance of transforming the ingredients in, in the cooker into a good meal. Um, set the temperature and pressure too high and the cover will blow off and the cooker stop releasing the ingredients of a meal across the room. So uh, we know that uh, we all have, have had experiences um, um, doing that sometimes and we've seen it, we've worked in uh, organizations uh, that, that have done it uh, and uh, you know something half cooked came out or something that came out that was really difficult to eat. <laughs> so it's just that, look, you have to be a good chef. You have to know when to, to uh, sort of uh, uh, get the, the dish, the right dish out. Um, and, you know, good leadership, like um, being a good chef, it's a tough job. Uh, and, uh, and that's the reality. Um, moving between the balcony and the dance floor. So, in the only way that I think one can really uh, um, get a, a, a reality check and a sort of a view of uh, um, a, a big picture is uh, to, at times, to be able to sort of distance yourself from the fray. Uh, I put the fray there. Uh, and uh, um, basically, um, you know, sometimes as, as a leader, we get too engaged, too hands-on, too detailed. And we become, you know, we marry our project. We, this, is, this, is, this is the project, no matter what, I'm not going to let it go. Um, this is mine. And then uh, um, you're not willing to, to look at the, the, the bigger sort of dance floor. What is happening? What is happening in my organization, in my department, in my office? Let's, you know, let me sort of step away a little bit, go on the dance floor, look at it. You know, by looking, 
sort of, you know, from a sort of a more macro level, I can see, oh, this particular side is not working the way it should be. That particular side is maybe doing a bit too much. So maybe I can go back on the dance floor and, you know, make sure that uh, um, what I saw upstairs, I can now shift it around, I can change it around and, and, and do different things with it. Um, sometimes as leaders, we have the tendency or people have the tendency to never go back to the dance floor. And, uh, you know, I always remember some, somebody giving, telling me about, um, um, I don't remember his name, he was the president of, of uh, uh, Toyota at, at one point. And he was always traveling around and, and, and going to different plants. And they said to him, you know, you're never in your office. You're always going around and, and, and visiting different plants. And he said, yeah, because we don't make cars in my office. <laughs> so, <laughs> so I think to, uh, it's, it's good to have the combination to, to be able to reflect, think, look at the big picture, but be part of it. Uh, don't, you know, just, uh, you know, sitting in my office and, and expecting you to get briefings from here and there and, you know, and so forth. I think it doesn't really do justice and it doesn't do the job. Um, so adaptive leadership in an interactive process. So you basically, uh, there is a, a observation where uh, um, it's a, a, a these are the, the three key elements of adaptive leadership. So observing events and patterns around you, interpreting what you're observing, developing a sort of a, a multiple hypothesis about what is really going on and the designing interventions based on your observations and interpretations to address the adaptive challenges you have identified. Now, this, Actually, I wanted to ask you if you can put the next slide before this and then this one. Yeah. No, uh, no, yeah, so exactly, exactly. So next one is, it says technical problems versus adaptive. Yeah, that one. So I think uh, technical problems versus adaptive challenge. So technical problems uh, have known solutions. Uh, that can be implemented by current know-how. Um, I was thinking of, for example, you know, an IT challenge that you have, you know? Ah, we just had it, <laughs> exactly. So um, that is a technical problem, right? And there were colleagues in the room that basically knew how to resolve it, and they resolved it. Um, but then adaptive challenges can only be addressed through changes in people's priority, beliefs, habits, and, and loyalties. Um, so if, as a leader, I have a technical problem in my outfit, in my, in my uh, the organization, in my department, um, then I can, you know, if it's an IT problem, I can bring an IT specialist to resolve it. But then if, it's really shifting the culture of the organization to become uh, a much more service-oriented culture. That is an adaptive challenge that I'm facing. And therefore, it requires you know, changing people's beliefs, priorities, uh, habits, and loyalty. And that's tough, because as I said before, people um, don't like changes. You know, they don't want to change because why should I change? And that's really an adaptive issue, problem that you're facing. So you have to invest quite a bit on changing people's attitudes. And people in general uh, are difficult to manage. Now try to change their, their whole set of beliefs and, and habits and practices and attitudes. Yes, it's required if you want to have a service-oriented sort of outfit, but that, Pressure cooker comes in, you put it, you, 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 you push it, you pull it um, until it happens. And it does happen um, if you do 
do it the, the, the right way. Now, if we can go to uh, change uh, and um, uh, and uh, adaptation, yes. So um, now, adaptive leadership specifically about change that enables the capacity to to uh, uh, to try. Now, I wanted to. Uh, use uh, um, uh, your experience uh, with uh, uh, the uh, using electricity. And I said that uh, um, I have personal sort of experience in dealing in, in, in Tehran um, with, with, with this issue, um, but not only there, many places in the world, and including Italy where I work. It happens every summer. It, it, it happens quite a bit. Um, I think there's a couple of issues around this, this, this problem. One is uh, if, as a public servant, you know, there is this tendency of a landlord versus tenant attitude, right? I am the landlord. I manage this, uh, 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 whatever the the ministry is uh, this, uh, uh, and therefore uh, I'm responsible to do my job, which is to provide electricity. Um, but if there's a problem, it's not really my fault. It's because you're not doing the right things, because you know there's, there's all kinds of um, technological problems, all kinds of the fact that we have so many people now living in Cape Town and the, the usage of electricity is this high, people don't pay for this and that. And I think if as a public servant, we change that sort of a, a landlord versus tenant attitude to more of I'm here to serve you, basically, as I said earlier in my presentation, that I get paid because you're paying my salary, then I think there will be a change in, 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 at least in the way that you have service providers, whether it's the tax office, whether it's the, 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 the electrical sort of, you know, if it comes from a sort of the, the, the government side or the private side, you know, there will be a shift as, as you call, yes, sir, we are aware of it, we're working on it, 10 minutes later, the electricity is back. You call, nobody answers the phone, and you don't have electricity for the next five hours. So I think that shift is, takes time. It, it basically, uh, um, it's, a, it's a difficult one, but it is a must. It's a required one. How do you do that? How do you build? sort of, you know, a cadre of public uh, servants that get into their head that my job is the provision of services to the citizens rather than, well, you know, this landlord and tenant kind of mentality. Um, so, we go to the next slide. What is good leadership? So, as I said, real leadership is about getting people to face reality and create what is needed to generate progress and improve the human condition. Um, so adaptive leadership requires reorganizing our values and norms, looking at the challenges that have been involving people to push real issues forward. Uh, leadership is an activity, it's not a title, we talked about it, it's the ability to mobilize people to address their own problems. Now, I thought this was very important. I wrote it down, actually, I will just read it for you. It's in public sector, short-term leaders and their long-term staff um, have inverse requirements and incentives. Adaptive leadership can break the vicious circle by deploying two adaptive leadership attributes. One, appointed leaders, should focus on having empathy for tenured people, uh, ten, tenured leaders and their needs and a willingness to build platforms 
for transparent collaboration invite a diversity of perspectives. So you have, you're a political appointee, you come to a job and there are people who've been there for many years and they actually are, are, are the ones that are moving and, 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 and shaking the, the, the institute this direction or that direction. You will come. You can come with your, 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 your thoughts and your vision and so forth. But as a sort of a political appointee, you will be there for a few years and you go, but these people will stay, you see. So I always try to, I've been in the, in, 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 in the South College in this job now for almost uh, 11 years, right? So sometimes I, I lose perspective that uh, um, I kind of think of it sometimes, you know, as my company. Um, so, but then I, I remind myself that no, there were people who sat on this chair before me, and one of these days, there will be another person sitting on this chair, and then I will move on. I will move on, and so I don't look at it as my kingdom, my thing, and this is, but what happens is that there are my colleagues and people who are actually moving the organization forward who will be here way after I leave. So how do I really sort of uh, um, create an environment where um, this sort of my role as, 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 as the appointed person and those that are there and will be there way after, how do we really sort of collaborate, cooperate, begin to see things collectively and really move together to resolve the challenges that we're facing. Because, you know, at no time I'm gone and someone else is coming. And these people, you have to look at them as not, you know, the problem is that these people have been here for years and years. Yeah, well, usually what happens in public sector, they do stay longer than you. So, uh, uh, and, also, for the ten-year leaders, I think they have to embrace adaptive uh, adaptivity themselves, um, and they have to welcome, for example, um, accountability. That they have. I am. I'm here for a long time. I will stay. I will probably retire in this institution, but I'm accountable. I'm accountable, um, and um, that is that comes uh, with shared leadership and delivering on short-term high priority policy requirements while championing courageously for the long term. So short-term, you do experimentation, you bring people on board uh, before we go for the huge stuff, for the big stuff, let's do a little bit of experimentation. Here, there, we learn from our, 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 from our experiments. We, you know, I always uh, tell my colleagues, go for it, let's experiment. Obviously, calculated in, uh, risk taking and calculated investment. I cannot put a million dollars into something and then if it's a flop, the whole loss a million dollars. But if we can take a little bit and just push the boundaries and push the boundaries, um, I think uh, we will go um, quite far in terms of what our sort of achievement is. Um, adaptive leadership, in my view, um, is really pushing the boundaries, but pushing the boundaries uh, slowly and, and, and also carefully. Um, but the more you push, the more you push, the better the outcome will be. Because if you're conscious of it and you're pushing the boundaries and you do see, uh oh, here is the, the sort of, you know, where I have to pause. I have to pause. Then I think chances that you actually realize that is the problem. I have to deal with it, but maybe through a different way uh, is much more that, you know, I go gung ho, I go all the way. If it requires laying off, you know, 100 people be it, that is the reality and, and so forth. Um, but if you somehow get the people to walk with you, um, 
chances are that you would be successful as well. I always say to, to my colleagues, you know, um, in fact, I give you very sort of a personal experience. When, when I first joined the, the college, uh, my boss, I joined in as the deputy in charge of the, the academic programs and so forth. And my boss, who Faisal knows very well, said to me, yeah, you came as a, you're here as a deputy you're in charge of, of, of all the programs and everything, but you have to design a leadership program. I said, that is your main thing, because now this institute is facing a, um, a problem where, uh, and the system, the UN system as a whole, wants the college to, to, to come up with an executive leadership program for the senior people in the UN. That's your job. And I said to myself, I've never done it before, you know, so what do I know? about developing a leadership program. So yeah, I had some ideas. If I was going to a leadership program, this is what I would have liked to listen to, to, to hear and so forth. But I brought people from all parts of the, the system, from different organizations within the UN. I brought uh, trainers and, and, and leadership experts from the outside, from the academia and so forth. So I created a team. And I always said that, look, you know, if we make it, we make it. But if we go down, I'm not going down alone. We're going down <laughs> all together. So I think that is basically probably the the the, the it, it it is the most important factor for a leader in the public sector to realize that you alone cannot do it. You gotta bring those people um, on board but be able to convince them that this is a good way to, to do it. And if they tell you it's not, be open, you know, here, here, and maybe even some of them have better ideas that, 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 that you do. So, and the last part is, is uh, you know, I started with, with, with talking about uh, why I believe that um, Mandela, um, Person advice, whatever good leadership is is uh, um, is all about. But uh, to me, uh, Mandela is also a reincarnation reincarna of adaptive leadership. Um, and uh, you know, he had his ideals were noble. His principles were unyielding. He remained, um, uh, but he remained flexible and adaptive in his approach. Um, he had a vision. Um, and uh, uh, he never wavered from that, that, that vision and, and the, the main principles. But he was also uh, a leader that was able to be flexible, to listen to others, to change it, the tactics here, there. At, at one point, uh, you, um, uh, you know, he didn't operate with a tunnel vision uh, because, you know, the tunnel vision, Sometimes, in most cases, it doesn't get you to where you want to go. Um, and, uh, you know, his vision for South Africa, equality for all, that was basically unwavering. But he wasn't, he wasn't shackled by it. Um, and and uh, I uh, uh, used uh, Stengel uh, in 20, 2008. Um, he said that uh, he overthrew apartheid and created a non-racial democratic South Africa by knowing precisely when and how to transition between his role as a warrior, martyr, diplomat, and statement. Uncomfortable with abstract philosopher concepts, he, was, he would often say to me that an issue was not a question of principle. It was a question of tactics. He's a master tactician, and he was. Vision remained the same, but tactics used. Um, I also, once I read um, in a, an interview with Castro, right after the, the, the Cuban revolution, they said, uh, so you have all these, you know, sort of men that were, you know, taking up arms and, and they were basically rebels and fighting and, you know, uh, but what do you do with them now? There is, you know, this sort of government in place. And he said, well, we don't need arms and anything anymore. So, uh, but now we need uh, 
you know, factory workers, we need farmers, we need, uh, so I uh, um, no longer need, you know, thousands and hundreds of thousands of people with guns, but I need people who are now working in factories. So he, he, he did it. And I think um, in many places, unfortunately, that doesn't happen. Uh, and, uh, but uh, South Africa is a good example of that, the fact that uh, with, with, with Mandela, it did happen. Of course, problems continue, but in terms of uh, he himself, um, I think it's a perfect example of adaptive leadership. So I stop here, I talk too much. I hope we have time for, for a conversation. Okay, great, well, that's What a pleasure, uh, what a pleasure to listen to you, uh, Jafar. I'm sure we could keep listening to you for the rest of the afternoon. Um, you clearly uh, are speaking from uh, a great deal of uh, experience and a very rich, uh, I think, um, a depth of, of, of knowledge and, uh, to, to, and uh, experience to draw on from the, from the UN system and uh, uh, drawing on the leadership of uh, people like Nelson Mandela and, uh, and Fidel Castro. Uh, I think um, tells us a great deal about uh, um, the the diversity of uh, of uh, you know the, the leadership uh, that we have seen and it uh, it uh, you know <coughs> your your reflection on both Mandela and uh, Castro uh, draws me to a, a an analogy from my own uh, experience where. <laughs> we, you know, uh, we had Castro and uh, Mandela and uh, Bill Clinton being on the same platform mm. only once, really? and that was um, in Geneva uh, at the 50th anniversary of the GATT. And uh, I recall this uh, from friends of mine, I wasn't there myself, say how Mandela had on either side Bill Clinton and uh, Fidel Castro. And uh, as you know, there wasn't much love between these two uh, countries. Uh, <laughs> it may be that personally, they didn't have any personal problems, but their countries had a lot of challenges. And, uh, and Mandela embraced both of them with a deep friendship, as you know, for a long time. Um, until his death, he remained good friends with uh, Bill Clinton, who visited South Africa um, many times uh, during the last days of Mandela. And of course, he remained a great admirer of, uh, of Fidel Castro, <laughs> and the feeling was mutual. Um, and uh, he had this uh, incredible ability to um, recognize leadership and uh, to work with uh, different people, as you say, his vision and his commitment to principle remained strong, but he was always able to adapt and change to the circumstances. Yeah. And uh, this is where he employed some extraordinary tactics in pursuing you know, relentlessly the vision. Sometimes people didn't understand yeah. what he was doing <laughs> and criticized him. But he remained firm yeah. you know, on the principle. So uh, thank you so much, really, for coming back to Nelson Mandela, because we are, after all, the Nelson Mandela School of Public Governance. But you draw on a lot of uh, experience of uh, others and academics um, to show how um, the complexity of today's world requires us not to uh, uh, assume that individuals are the answers or to rely on individuals, but really to have a style of leadership that draws on the knowledge and expertise of uh, everybody. Everyone has a role, everyone has agency, and we need to empower exactly. to exercise that agency. So uh, really a lot of food for thought and um, a lot of interesting ideas um, and analogies that you draw on to explain uh, the concept of adaptive leadership. 
let me open the floor for anyone who wants to comment and particularly those of you who are online and you um, have comments on the chat, uh, we can draw your uh, questions to um, um, Jafar to uh, respond to. Uh, yes, please go ahead. Please go ahead. Do you have any comment about vice versa? I'm sorry, I can't recall in at which part of the presentation it's there, but please come on. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, thanks for, for this incisive and insightful um, presentation and lecture. I hope I'm audible enough. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> All right. Thank you. No, my, my, my comment was based on the on the technical problems versus adaptive challenges and where, where Doc mentioned the fact that uh, I like the part where it says the most common cause of failure in leadership is produced by treating adaptive challenges as if they were technical problems. Mm -hmm. I'm not sure whether it did. I heard Doc talking about electricity. I was trying to, to, to plug that into the current, current energy issues in the country <laughs> to say what's your observation around around the, the, the current challenges that we've got in terms of energy in the country. Well, what, what would be your take? Thanks, that's, that's my question. That is why I ended up saying, perhaps it's vice versa in terms of uh, trying to, to, to use technical solutions for, I mean, adaptive solutions to technical solutions. So those are the issues that I have I'm battling with currently. Thank you. Sure. Thank you, Nadine if you would like to um, raise your comment, um, because there's other two comments in the chat, and then I think we can answer. Should I ask my question? Yeah. Go ahead. Can you? Can everyone hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Go ahead. Okay. Hello. Okay, maybe Anyone else has a question or a comment that you'd like to uh, make? Um, as I think Jafar said, he's, he's happy to have a conversation. So if you'd like to you know, make some comments or express your own view on any of the points that he's made, uh, please do so. Yes, please go ahead. Um, thank you for the presentation. Uh, my question or my uh, observation was around uh, young emerging leaders. And what's your observation in terms of an enabling environment for us to reach an equilibrium where we acknowledge that we have our senior leaders um, in organizations or different platforms, but we also have a new uh, emerging sort of class or cohort of young leaders who want to make a contribution and how can we make an adaptive environment for both to coincide, particularly talking to my context uh, in terms of uh, the country that I come from where it seems uh, you are undermined particularly by your age and you're not really able to uh, coincide with existing, um, existing elder leaders. So, how do we enable that adaptive environment whereby we have both and um, we, are, we have both and we're also able to achieve progress rather than uh, young people trying to continuously prove themselves worthy of the platform? Thank you. Japan, maybe. Sure, sure. Um, yeah, some, some, some of the questions are technical questions that somehow sort of deals with, with adaptive. 
sort of uh, uh, an adaptive approach to, to um, the situation that we're describing. You know, on the energy, uh, you all know the, the, the problem is much better than I do, um, but I believe that there's obviously a technical issue here. Um, and it's, you know, uh, it's, 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 it's related to uh, the capacity the, the, uh, of, of the, you know, generators and all the sort of electrical grids. And, you know, it's a very technical thing. Um, and that, that obviously has to be resolved, has to be, but, it, you know, it, 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 it's done by um, engineers and, and things like that. But there is an adapt, adaptive, and I believe in this, that I think we as citizens, we also have to be conscious that, that we have to be able to save energy. We cannot um, expect a, a smooth 24-hour sort of a life by uh, not turning off the, the, the electricity when we leave the room, um, not plugging in the phone, the computer, this and that, and, and uh, you know, everything uh, at, at our disposal. Um, so that requires an adaptive shift. It does, uh, um, while the technical issue has to be resolved, um, uh, but also, um, you know, from a sort of a citizen perspective, we also have to be conscious that we to play our, our role correctly. Now, there are, I'm sure, at least in, in my own country, all kinds of issues comes in, you know, corruption comes in, private sector engagement and, 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 and deals and contracts and, you know, that kind of thing. But that has to be resolved at a political level. Um, but um, in fact, the energy problem to me is a good example to show that there are technical side, but there are adaptive side. And the adaptive side is deals with social, meaning the citizens performing uh, uh, duties and responsibilities, and the politicians sort of performing their job as public sector servants in making sure that the contract goes to the best company, not the company of friends and, and family and things like that. So that would be my, my, my answer or my comment on the first question that was raised on, on Uganda, you know, I think once you have, and I have to be careful because I'm here in my UN capacity, so, <laughs> you know, um, but you have good leadership, you have bad leadership, right? So leadership is actually, it, when we talk about leadership, we also have to talk about bad leadership, mm -hmm. and there are plenty uh, uh, examples of bad leadership you know, and what bad leadership is all about. And so maybe um, to some extent is, 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 is not really sort of the best, uh, um, you know, leadership that we experience that allows these kind of uh, things to, 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 to happen because uh, um, especially uh, um, now I think uh, this is not a new, Phenomena, it's been happening in Uganda and many places in the world. Not, it's not just Uganda, um, many places. And to me, unfortunately, that is the result of bad leadership. Mm -hmm. uh, and, uh, um, you know, um, and bad leaders have a lot of followers as well. Mm -hmm. And that's the problem, you know, that's the problem. And in fact, uh, uh, leaders don't become leaders if they don't have followers, right? So whether you're a bad leader or a good leader, you have a, a, a contingency of people behind you, except when you have bad leadership, things like that happens. Um, but if you have good leadership, then the opposite sort of takes place. So I think in that particular context, um, that is probably, well, uh, uh, a reality that, that we are facing. But as I said, it's not only in Uganda, unfortunately, in many places in the world, um, we still are dealing with some of the basic fundamentals, rights, uh, uh, um, that unfortunately is being denied to a, a, a segment of the population. Um, young people, I think it goes both ways. You know, sometimes it, I see that young people, um, you know, they look at the older crowd as, you know, 
sort of has beens and you know what do they know and this, you know that and that kind of thing. <laughs> right? So I think it 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 uh, um first sort of the, the 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 senior leaders and so forth bring a lot of experience to the table. Um and uh, it's 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 uh sort of uh too basic to just uh um ignore you know that that experience experience I think uh, makes a, a, a lot of uh, sort of sense uh, in, in terms of when you are trying to deal with a particular the, the, you know, issue that you're facing, a problem that you're dealing with, a challenge that is sort of around you. Um, you know, experience means a lot. Um, and uh, although, you know, Faisal's white hair, my white hair. <laughs> you know, it means that at one point we were young also. <laughs> you know, so uh, uh, definitely uh, using the, the knowledge and the experience and so. However, on the other hand, as, as senior leaders, we have to be very conscious and cognizant of the fast changing world that now today, what my, my, my daughter uh, is dealing with, I did not deal with, uh, um, but I was in my 30s, in, in my 30s. So she brings things to the table, which I have no clue. So it's actually for, for me, it's fun to understand, to learn, to, to, to sort of use uh, sort of their view of things uh, and also believe the fact that, uh, you know, one day they are going to be calling the shots. One day they are going to be the ones making the decision. So, um, uh, and how do you mentor, you know, the, 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 uh, the, the younger generation? How do you also um, sort of share your experiences and create, um, you know, some kind of a, a, a rapport with, with a group of people who are going to be the future leaders? And what is my job as, as someone in, in, in his sixties now to make sure that you have the right people um, committed, bright, uh, intelligent to do um, the job, especially when it comes to the public sector. So that mentorship, that, that sort of uh, creating that support system is a must. Um, and uh, without it, then unfortunately, but there is a two way street. Uh, I think uh, um, that if, if that two way sort of a sort of a connection takes place, then uh, good things happen. But if, if it doesn't, unfortunately, again, taking it up to another level in many places, including my own country, unfortunately, that dialogue between the young, what they want, people who were born 20 years ago, 25 years ago, and the leadership who's now basically a step away from the grave is not taking place. Mm -hmm. And that is basically um, the main, you know, sort of problem that the society is facing is expectation and the leadership where it's just not hearing what the young people are Thank you so much. Um, I think there are other comments on Rusta. Please go ahead and ask your question. Sure, okay. thank you. And good afternoon. Thank you, Dr. Javan, for a very interesting lecture. Um, my comment is really um, just thinking about the gendered nature of leadership, you know, as it sits in our perception. Um, you know, in this conversation, uh, we've we've used the he um, as a as a way of talking about the leader, and that's of course not a criticism. It's more a, a observation of our societal perspective mm -hmm. as it currently exists. And you know, I wonder because so many of these adaptive leadership qualities that you've described in your presentation are very clearly rooted in the feminine. You know, we, we have all of these efforts and programs, uh, you know, about kind of geared towards empowering women and things like that, almost as a, to address inequality. 
But I wonder if a deliberate repositioning regarding who does leadership is in itself a tool for growing adaptive leadership practices in the development sector and the public sector more specifically. And I just wanted to get your thoughts on that. Sure, sure, thank you. First of all, my apology if I use he uh, in, in, in talking about good leadership. It by no means, and in fact, I am uh, uh, very conscious of it in my writing and, and, and when I talk that I don't use he or I don't use uh, his, you know, I always make sure that the, uh, uh, in fact, uh, in fact, to the extent that that is possible, I talk about she as the leader and her rather than his, because I think this has to be um, used in every occasion and every sort of uh, possibility to push that when we talk about good leadership, we're not talking about, um, again, the boy, or good old boy network of men, you know, the, the, no. In fact, uh, if anything that we also learned from COVID was some of the best or, or most successful examples of good leadership came from places where women were, were um, sort of at the helm of, 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 of the government. Um, and uh, in, whether it was in Scotland or it was in New Zealand and, 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 and many other places, women basically were absolutely uh, uh, much more effective than, than some of our male leaders. Um, now, I don't know. I mean, I think that, that um, there are some, um, you know, maybe it's sort of this men gung-ho, I know it all and this and that, that allows men to become victims of bad leadership rather than women that are willing to talk, willing to listen, willing to uh, um, sort of uh, um, sort of manage things differently than, than men, that makes women to be better leaders uh, than, than, than men. Um, I mean, it's this uh, um, sort of ability to look at different issues from different angles, different um, come up with different solutions, multitasking, uh, um, which uh, allows women to, to uh, be better leaders. Um, I don't know, I'm sure there are scientific sort of studies being done, um, but then we also have to make sure that we don't fall victim to this, that women are better leaders than men. I think it's a human sort of a nature because there are many also women who, when they get to the position of leadership, they actually are not good leaders. Why? Because they try to uh, basically follow sort of a very traditional approach to leadership, which is predominantly being done by men. So it just now in the last 50 years or so, we're beginning to see women emerging, whether it's in the public sector or the private sector, in position of leadership, right? So if it's imitation of men leadership, then usually it doesn't work and it shows itself. But it's a sort of a, what you call, I think, uh, a, a feminine approach to, to leadership. Um, then it's a whole different ballgame, and I think it's much more effective. Um, but I, I, I uh, don't think that we have to, we can really sort of make a, a, a general statement by saying, well, women are better. It depends. It depends. It depends on, on who are we talking about. It depends on the context. It depends. So uh, my suggestion would be that it's a good issue is, is, is probably a human trait rather than a gender-based trait. Um, but uh, with more women coming into the position of leadership, um, then I hope they don't try to emulate sort of the, 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 the sort of usual sort of male approach to, to leadership uh, of uh, authoritarian, but they do adapt to what I just described as adaptive leadership. Yeah, thank you so much. Brilliant, please go ahead. Um, thank you. I really enjoyed your lecture. And just a reminder of what
what a powerful framing adaptive leadership is. You know, to throw it back at the people. We have to figure it out. There is no textbook, right? right. So, um, but I think what your what your talk also demonstrated was that leadership matters, um, and so it's important that we have good, ethical, effective leaders because individual leaders in positions of power and influence. They can inspire people to build or to destroy. Absolutely. And so, you know, the more powerful you are and what position of power that you exercise, it's really, really important how you exercise um, that leadership. And I was thinking about populist leaders, another yeah. example of being someone like Trump, which is the opposite of an adaptive leadership. <laughs> you know, it's painless and simple, and he's going to solve everything. And then thinking about Zelensky. And specifically when you talked about, you know, that leadership is not a title, but it's an act that you're performing. And so as a performative act of leadership, I mean, he's quite extraordinary in the sense that he, I think, embodies that, that compassion, that humility, that creativeness. But also there's a BBC interview with him where he talks about humor. Right. And exactly. when you have humor, you can control the situation. And as everyone knows, that he was a stand-up comic, um, and his yeah. sitcom was called Servant of the People. And there are five seasons of that where he was performing as a president, and then you can't make it up. He, he is the president. And so this idea of it being an activity, an ongoing activity, and just maybe a just brief comment on, on populism and how we encounter Act of populist leadership. Sure, sure. I think you 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 said it all. You know, populism. We had uh, in in the U.S. We had Trump, um, and uh, you saw. We still you know, have Trump. We still have, unfortunately, <laughs> yes. We still have. We may have back, Trump back again in in uh, you know less than two years. Um, so. Uh, because I think, you know, it's much simpler to be a populist, no? I mean, there is always a solution to a problem. Uh, and, and there's always, they're easy, it's easy. The world is easy. You don't want to go into complications because people don't want to hear, you know, complexity and, 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 and this and that. They want, this is a problem, they want somebody to tell them, this is the way up. Hmm? Easy, straightforward, in less than, you know, five minutes. Um, unfortunately, we have many of those, you know, sort of coming into the picture in the world in different countries. We have it in, in, in um, we have it in Europe, we have it in, in Africa, we have it in Asia, we have it in uh, in the Middle East, and that's really dangerous. That is dangerous because, um, but at the same time, you know, I always think that. Um, how do you get people um, to be able to digest bad news? And sometimes, if as a leader, you and I said in my presentation, that you come up with bad news, then you have to sort of think about your um, the election coming up. And if I'm the bearer of bad news all the time, then for sure I'm not going to see a second term, right? So, um, but if I'm constantly on the positive, although it's lie, although it's based on 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 sort of uh, uh, a set of uh, really uh, just wishful thinking that will never happen, people like to to uh, to hear that that they although. We're beginning to see, and I think the elections in the U.S. was a sort of a good example that at the end of the day, there are people who actually do think, you know, they, 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 they do think, they understand the complexities, they um, are not looking for short sound bites that are, um, you know, sort of pleasing to the ears, they're willing, and I think the majority of the, the population in the world um, are much more sophisticated than what we sometimes we think. Um, sometimes, you know, I, I, uh, I'm actually Iranian American, so I'm very much, uh, I follow the American politics very closely. And sometimes I say, oh my God, you know, how can they think like this? But then 
I get my sort of hope is sort of regenerated when I see that in local elections, for example, you get people um, who are sort of, you know, absolute opposite of the pop, you know, the populist uh, uh, politicians, and they win. They win, uh, uh, you know, the, the House, they win uh, um, sort of a bit for the Senate and, and all these things. So, although sometimes I really lose hope, I also sort of gain back hope, hope by seeing that there are people that actually um, do understand and respect um, those that are not basically doing, you know, three minute sound by campaigns by by line and and, and 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 now what I always do when I go into sort of universities and, and talk to, to young people, um, I always say, you know, now um, you have this tremendous access to social media. You have TikTok, you have Instagram, you have Facebook, you have many other sort of, you know, apps that you're using most of it for um, connecting with friends and talking about parties and this and that. But become an activist, become an activist and use it for social mobilization, for social mobilization that leads to political changes, political sort of advancement towards better things, you know? So don't use it just to, to show off, I don't know, whatever, the, the, the new uh, uh, the, the designer thing, or but use it for that. And unfortunately, that is not happening as much as I think could, should happen. Um, so, but I'm hopeful, I'm hopeful, you know, one of my main sort of messages that I try to pitch all the time is believe in multilateralism, you know, you're dealing with a situation like Trump, like, uh, um, uh, you know, Hungary, uh, where it's nationalism, it's, you know, we have, we, we've had it in Italy, uh, um, and, uh, so what happens, but the world is too complicated. It can only be resolved if we begin to work as a united nation. And I'm not talking about you, you, United Nations as my organization, but a global sort of uh, cooperation, collaboration between nations. And otherwise, and we saw it, we saw it very clearly with COVID. And I think the COVID, the reason that still in 2023, we still are talking about COVID, although less than last year and the year before and so forth, is because we still, you know, immediately we went into our sort of nationalistic, populistic kind of view of the world. It doesn't happen here. In, how could it not happen there? It's you not know, with today's world when people are traveling and trading and back and forth and this and that. There is no, there was no geographical boundaries that sort of saved me from whatever COVID did. So if we can then have people in high positions, in leadership positions that really promote the, the unity and the fact that we all, you know, there is no planet B. We are all no planet A and maybe one day there will be a planet B. But we need to work to, to, with each other. We need to, uh, uh, we, we all more or less believe in the same values and so forth. So I'm hopeful. And I think this populism will come and go. Uh, I think we maybe, I have too much faith in humanity, but uh, without it, we can't go on. Thank you so much. Two more questions on the last ah, okay. so any person here. Yeah. Sure, um, sure. Um, Dennis, do you want to come online and raise your question and then after Mandisa? Uh, thank you, um, Dr. Jaffa. Dr. Jaffa, uh, it has been an excellent hour for me. And uh, my question is very specific to the model on adaptive leadership. And the two takeaways for me are the shift in paradigm that this model presents as being one from person-oriented to activity-focused leadership, and then getting 
away from just mobilizing followers to actually mobilizing people to face reality is quite fundamental for me. And it's helpful in all spheres of life. How can we use this model to incentivize continental leaders to appreciate it such that we can have some social and democratic order in Africa? And my question is framed on the basis that we have seen leaders in Africa who have taken over 30 years and they are perhaps doing more harm than good. And they do not appreciate these dynamics because everything around them, all the politics around them is centered on the leader. How can we incentivize them to appreciate uh, this uh, dynamic? Thank you. Hello, Mandisa, please go ahead. Mandisa, you uh, muted. Hello. Uh, Hello. Yes, Hello. Yes, can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Go ahead. Oh, okay. No, my question is just straightforward. As a former executive in the public service, my observation over the years and in reading a lot about leadership, I have noticed this trend of people having high tolerance levels for poor leadership from men, and it's by both genders, by the way. And also, as a woman, we I'm going to speak about me and maybe let me not generalize. I tended to probably act as a big sister, as a motherly coach. And that gets misinterpreted as weak. And I've, 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 I've um, I decided I'm not going to change. <laughs> because once you change the way you, you, you lead, which comes from the heart, then it changes who you are. And also, it, 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 because if you don't change also, it also affords you an opportunity to reflect on, on the weaknesses that you may have that you may not be aware of. But my main question is the one that's written, that's written down. What's your take on this and what, what the UN has done to actually deal with this matter if it's still prevalent in the UN? I'm saying that I, I will, I'm interested to know what the you how the UN has dealt with this if it is prevalent in the UN. Uh, with the, this is the issue of uh, the notion of of having high tolerance levels for poor leadership from by men. Ah uh, yes yes yes. The women so, have high tolerance levels. Yes yes that that, that <laughs> men's men's. Uh, um, Bad leadership is tolerated, ah, you know, uh, relative to women. So good question. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Maybe I take this one and then I come to the African leadership. Yes. A question. Yeah, yeah. I, I agree because I think the world still is run by men in general. Yes, they're beginning to 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 you know there be some shifts and changes and women in higher positions and so forth. But uh, still, you know, if you look at it, it's the good old boys network that is sort of calling the shots and making decisions and, 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 and so forth. And that has to change. I mean, that, absolutely, that has to change. But I think, you know, um, I cannot agree with you more. It's more tolerated um, because most leaders in the public sector, um, private sector, are men. Uh, and that is that is a problem that, that we have. Um, but then again, you know, why um, are we getting enough women, capable, qualified women to sort of challenge uh, men? I sure hope so in the United Nations. I really honestly hope that if we don't have a women's secretary general um, next, then we better, better, you know, close the door, go home, forget it. It's all you talk about. You know, women empowerment and women leadership is just a bunch of nothing. So I really hope uh, um, that the, uh, because, you know, UN is, is, is an important place to show mm -hmm. that actually uh, um, you walk the walk and talk the talk and all that that goes with it. So now we have in the World Bank a woman as the president. We have uh, it, uh, at the 
international monetary funds, IMF, women. So it's time to, to have a women's sector in general. Uh, and uh, I sure hope um, that the, this happens soon, in the, in the next two, two, two and a half years. Mm -hmm. I think there will be 20, 26, 26. So, yeah, so that is sort of what I'm hoping. Now, in terms of African leadership, I think things are also changing. I mean, yes, maybe 20 years ago, across the continent, you had sort of most leaders in you know, 20, 30 years the, the, um, in, in power. But I'm beginning to see uh, a little bit of a shift, which gives me hope that things are uh, um, changing. I think uh, there are many examples uh, in, 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 the, in the continent um, in the last uh, few years that tells us that there is uh, a tendency for younger sort of, you know, um, uh, more uh, sort of democratic leaders to emerge and, and, and take on the, the, the jobs. Um, but unfortunately, there are also many other examples that show that every time or in some places, every time there's an attempt, it's basically uh, you know, put down and, and the sort of the old uh, system takes over again. Um, how do you change this? I think by, I don't know, citizens' education, civic education, people understanding, but that is part of it. The other is also, you know, by the sort of geopolitical realities and, and uh, sort of um, the, uh, uh, you know, what happens outside of Africa and decisions that are made uh, outside and in the capitals and, and so forth. So, uh, but then again, what can we do as just ordinary citizens is to uh, promote and, and, and educate and, and, uh, and sort of uh, push the whole concept of civic responsibility and, and social participation and community empowerment and involvement in decision making. Right. Perfect. Well, thank you so much. It has been really an extraordinary um, hour and a half to listen to you and uh, the conversation between uh, colleagues uh, in the room and online uh, about uh, uh, our understanding of leadership. Uh, you've given us uh, some uh, theoretical concepts and framing to uh, think about the question, to debate it and discuss it amongst us. You've also drawn a, on, a, on a very, very rich uh, experience, uh, working as you do every day with the, the leadership in the United Nations, both with your staff, but also interacting with uh, leaders um, from uh, many countries that make up the whole of the United Nations, really have a, a very rich uh, depth of knowledge there to, to draw on, and, and you shared that with us. And um, uh, we have learned uh, also about uh, uh, global governance and the United Nations and how that's why I'm, I'm always very excited to engage with the United Nations because it's still uh, the beacon of hope for the world. It brings together all our people, uh, countries from around the world, small and big, uh, poor and rich, and uh, unites us in a discourse and a dialogue about our current and future problems and how we need to resolve them together. Many things are still wrong in the UN, <clears throat> the way it works, um, the power asymmetries and rules, but that is a discourse itself that is taking place. But there's no doubt in my mind that many of the most powerful uh, values and rights that we have, uh, we know today, they emerged in the discourse in the United Nations. And year after year, we kept talking about it until we began to realize some of those, including the issue of gender, parity and equality and consciousness. So thank you so much. It's a great partnership for us, the Nelson Mandela School, to work with you, uh, to keep learning from you, and uh, uh, sharing uh, the rich uh, resources you have with our students. 
and uh, our uh, the academy that we are building uh, for the African continent here yeah, in the Nelson Mandela School. So thank you so much uh, for that. Um, and uh, uh, thanks to everyone for participating in this uh, fantastic discussion. So thank you.